the uh, the uh, big hand is on the 31. So why don't we get started? Um, we're already recording on live on loot uh, on uh, YouTube. Um, welcome everybody. Glad to see everybody here. We are probably I, I don't think I'm quite ready to do a vaccine uh, census, but and not until Radner tells us they're having meetings in person, are we going to have meetings in person? Although we did do a live uh, star party last weekend that we'll we'll talk about. Um, I have a, I have a couple things to talk about. Um, first is and and Robert Treblecox on on the uh, on uh, with us tonight. There is a uh, book club called the Delaware Astronomy. The Delaware Astronomy Society has a book group, and uh, we met. We, I've been to two of the meetings. They've been around a lot longer than I've been going. Um, but the last two meetings were quite interesting. Uh, we read Thomas Harriet, A Life in Science by Robin Arianhood. And Thomas Harriet was a contemporary of uh, Sir Walter Raleigh and did a, a great deal of um, breakthrough science pr prior to Galileo in navigation and um, optics uh, and but he never published because he, Sir Walter Raleigh was his benefactor. So he didn't have that need to write a book, publish a book or anything like that. He, he was content just to sort of be a scientist. Uh, it was a fascinating and, and the group, we actually had uh, the author all the way from New Zealand join us. Um, uh, just this past Wednesday, uh, we finished up America's first great eclipse, which is written by Steve Ruskin about the uh, Eclipse of 1868, I think it was. And um, Steve Ruskin was met with us too. So um, that's a group that meets uh, once a month. There's a book list. I don't know what the assignment is for April yet, but if you're interested, email me um, at president at dva.org and I'll get you on that email list and uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, second thing I wanna mention is Don, uh, Don Nab from uh, Chesco has, uh, they're planning to go to Cherry Springs August 10th to August 13th. As luck would have it, the Woodsman's Festival, or whatever the Lumberman's Festival, whatever they call that obscure party, is the weekend of the new moon in August. So um, they're looking at Tuesday, August 10th through to August 13th to go up there. Uh, they're going to be, it's going to be their quote official event, but if anybody's interested, uh, I think Don, I think uh, Janet is probably going to mention it too tonight, and it'll be cross posted to our listserv if you're interested. Um, I'm going to try and get up there in August at some point. I don't know whether I'll go during the week. I wanted to go in July, but my, my son scheduled a family vacation during the July new moon, and I didn't have any say in that. Um, third, um, we got an offer, somebody offered a Mead 395. It's a refracting telescope. As she sent me some pictures, the mount looks like it's darn close to rusted, but I can't really tell. Um, I don't think it's something we would even rent out. Um, but if anybody's interested in, in playing with one or modifying it or maybe finding another one and turning it into binoculars, um, let me know. Uh, off list again, president at dva.org, and I'll put you together with the possible donor. Um, the other thing I thought I'd do since Andrew's not here is sort of give you a quick tour of the skies for April. Um, March 4th, Vesta was at opposition. It was at magnitude, just a little bit more than magnitude six. It's now in Leo through April and into May. It will turn retrograde near the end of April. Um, it is visible, it's, it's naked eye in good skies but it's binocular, it's visible in binoculars and it's certainly visible in a, in a medium scope. Um, April 5th through 8th, the moon's gonna swing by Jupiter and Saturn in the morning sky in Capricorn, if you wanna get up early. Um, April 8th, Ingenuity, which is the helicopter on Perseverance uh, is going to be launched for the first time. That is gonna be really cool. Um, uh, April 12th is the new moon this month. Uh, April 19th are the, the Eta Aquarids start. They run till the end of May. So they'll, they'll only be slight 
the lyrids are actually a few days later, April 22nd into the 23rd. Unfortunately, that's getting, that's the last uh, quarter of the moon. It's getting into a waxing moon there. And April 27th is what's known as the pink moon and it will be a super moon. So we'll hear all about that on the weather forecasts about it's a super moon and people will be going, I don't know why they call it a super moon. It doesn't have a cape. Um, the last thing I want to mention is there's a Nova in Cassiopeia. Um, if you drew a right triangle between, I think it's M8, correct? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, um, M87, maybe M81, and the bubble nebula, it would be the um, axis of the right triangle. Um, it's visible again in binoculars and in, um, in a telescope. Thank you, thank you. I knew I had the Messier object wrong, but it's, it's, um, I'm reading reports by people who are all finding it relatively easy to find. Um, so if you wanna see a brand new Nova, uh, it's up there. It just recently got a name. And with that, I will turn it over to our, um, our uh, chairs, committee chairs in the same order in which they're normally sitting at Radnor. So that means, Brian, you're next. Okay, we have uh, four new members and one returning member. Uh, Patricia Kelly, and I'll get you that email after the meeting, Lewis. Uh, Paul Osmeglick, and John uh, Gaskill, and Sheila Burke Gaskill. And the returning member is uh, uh, Maura Smith uh, Mitski. Now, and there's John. Faithwife. Hello, John. Welcome aboard. Good to see you. Welcome. Hello. Uh, okay. And we go to Lewis. Well, firstly, uh, anytime anyone says new Nova, that makes me crack up a little bit. So, so you got uh, me. Congratulations for that. And uh, so, um, you know, we're in the middle of the year. We have 159 people or 158 registered. Uh, you know, Patricia will be our 159th, so we're doing good. I was particularly pleased this week to receive an unsolicited donation. Uh, and uh, I would encourage you all to do likewise. If you go to the website all the way to the right on the menu, there's information about uh, gifts to the DVAA and you can do them in four types. You can give us cash, we always love it. And just in case you're wondering what the cash does, it helps us with our mission of doing meetings, bringing in speakers, doing outreach and, and what have you. And, you know, keep keeping Harold in bonbons or whatever other delightful things he likes. And uh, uh, you can do as I have done. There is a bequest in my will to the DBAA, a rather substantial one, as it turns out. Uh, you can do what I did, and I raised more than I think it was ten or twelve thousand uh, dollars. I had a matching program with my work when I used to work for Microsoft that did a whole bunch of donations. And of course, we have when we get back into uh, Radnor and other places, we have people who donate things like door prizes and other other scopes and, and, and things which are really grateful. But the DBAA has been quite the institution and uh, we love it when you support it. Uh, so anyone has any uh, questions about that, please reach out to me. Thank you. Treasure at dbaa.org. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, Michael, tell us about last week's star party. It was excellent. We had excellent weather. We had a great turnout. We had quite a number of things to see in the sky, including an, a beautiful ISS pass. And while we were showing an object on the screen uh, through our projector, of course, and our screen, um, we had a satellite pass through the, through, through the field of view. Uh, everybody was quite pleased. Um, we had a lot of good questions at the individual uh, tables. I see a lot of the people that uh, uh, members of our club who were there right here in our little little thumbnails right here at this meeting. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming out. And I don't, anybody know the date of the next star party? I don't see it. We have I, this thing called a website you may have I know, right. but I, I try <laughs> to have that stuff in front of me. Also Jeez. on the newsletter, right? Yes, so uh, true, I'm on is. the website, public star party, April 17th. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hope to see you always listed on the website. Uh, the excellent website, by the way, which which pleases me no end because people seem to keep maintaining it. The original vision. Thank you, Bill McGinney. Yeah, yeah. Um, outreach. Speaking of Janet. He's muted. 
Janet, you're muted. There, there you, you are. Go. There you go. I figured it out. Sorry. I'm Janet Rush, uh, VP and Outreach Chair. We do have an outreach event coming up in April, I'm happy to say. And Al Lamperti is going to be leading this. It's in Upper Providence Township. And it will be according to the same format that we've done for the Valley Forge Star Parties. So um, there's registration for that um, on the Upper Providence website. And April 27th is the date. I'd also like to mention that if, uh, uh, if Chester County Amateur uh, Astronomy Society is offering a great series of uh, introductory astronomy lectures that many people have been attending. If you haven't had a chance to get in on that, there are two more sessions there on Monday nights. And um, on the website, you can, uh, you can find the, uh, the information on that. You need to send an email to Don Nab in order to get the Zoom, the Zoom meeting, but they're really well done. And um, I encourage anyone who's interested to take a look. I think the next two topics, uh, the next one's on uh, telescopes and binoculars. And the week after that is deep sky observing. Thanks, Janet. Um, and that takes us, anybody else have any reports, any committee chairs? I asked everybody to let me know and I believe I heard from everybody. So with that in mind, I'm turning the meeting over to Jeremy, take it away. All right, thanks Harold. Actually, I did have a question from uh, Bill Thomas. Uh, he asked me at, uh, he said at the Swarthmore Observatory, they have a bunch of piers ready to mount telescopes that are kept indoors. He asked, is there a standard fitting for the top of such piers? So I don't know the answer to that. I can help you guys. Um, not really. <laughs> Everything is all unique, but uh, there is, there are plenty of services that you can you're, you're, you're breaking up. Too far away, Lewis. Is this better? No. No. This is not better. That's better. That's better. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how much I could really help with this, but uh, there's no real standard. Uh, however, there is uh, there are a couple of people uh, throughout the country, and I'm sure you could find machinists or whatever that can uh, they offer service to customize your uh, whatever mount you have to fill a pier. Um, there's one guy in Utah. If somebody's interested, let me know and I'll forward you the information. But there's no there's no real standard because you know you just have to make that stuff up. You usually just weld it together on the fly. There was another question that came up on the listserv. Um, somebody was asking for help they had a telescope and they didn't know how to use it. Um, I suggested that they come to one of our star parties. Um, I, I, the way we're doing the star parties, is that appropriate? Uh, is that an appropriate suggestion? Michael, does that make sense? Uh, we actually had a gentleman show up at the last star party that we just got done talking about, and we okay. did have to tell him to not, not allow anybody else to view through the telescope okay. because of COVID restrictions. Okay. Uh, and our insurance and so on. Um, so I believe that is the answer that I would give at this current time. So don't bring it yet. That's, That's correct. Answer. Okay, thanks. Okay, Jeremy. All right. So now for uh, our featured uh, presentation this evening. So first I'll give you a little uh, preview of some upcoming meetings. Uh, next month, we're gonna have Dr. Dan Wertheimer. So he's from uh, Berkeley and SETI. So he'll be talking about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. In May, we're going to have Michelle Hanlon, who's in the School of Law at the University of Mississippi. And she's going to be talking about space and law. So I'm not sure exactly which way that's going to go, but it sounds uh, pretty interesting. All right, so just as a reminder, if you are not the speaker, uh, please uh, mute your microphone when, it's, uh, when the speaker is uh, presenting. So we'll try to keep the, uh, the noise level down a little bit. All right, so I'm very pleased uh, tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Stephanie Lamassa. So uh, Steph did her uh, undergraduate work in astronomy and physics at Boston University and did her graduate work at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she did a postdoc at Yale and has also worked at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, currently, she's at STSCI, that's the Space Telescope Science Institute 
the Hubble folks. And she's a support scientist and the branch manager of the James Webb Space Telescope Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph Instrument Team. Hopefully I got that right. So step research interests include supermassive black holes, active galactic nuclei, and quasars. Uh, she uses a multi-wavelength approach, uh, including x-rays, optical, infrared, and ultraviolet. Uh, Steph has also been very active in outreach. Uh, she's active in a program called Astronomy on Tap, which I think is uh, of interest to us. Uh, how might I put this delicately? We are drinkers with an astronomy problem, so uh, something that may be of interest to us. So without further ado, I'll present our uh, speaker for this evening, Dr. Steph Lamassa. So take it away, Steph. All right, thanks very much. Um, I mean, for me... at least a little clapping. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I will go ahead and start the screen share. Okay, and play the presentation. All right, just double checking that you can see my slides. All right, I'm seeing the th thumbs up, but that's good. Yes, you can. Oh, okay, great. All right, so black holes are arguably the most enigmatic objects in the universe. They rightfully captivate the imagination. And though they serve as an inspiration for a myriad of science fiction media, they very much have their basis in science fact. Black holes are a natural consequence of um, the formulation of gravity as described by general relativity, which says that objects with mass curve the fabric of space itself. So the motion of objects, whether they be planets, moons, comets, even light itself, could be understood by its interaction with that curved space. And the more massive an object is, the more space-time itself is curved. So taken to its extreme, you could have an object compacted into such a small region of space that its density becomes infinite. And this, at this point, you create a singularity where you have interesting consequences for uh, what the escape speed um, from that object would be. So the escape velocity is the amount of speed that an object needs to take in order to get away from the gravitational pull of a body. It depends on an object's mass and an object's radius. So for the Earth, the escape speed is 11.2 kilometers per second. If we have a little rocket ship that is able to go faster than this, than the speed, then our um, rocket ship can then go merrily into interplanetary space. If, however, um, we replace Earth with a black hole, then the escape speed is the speed of light. And now if our poor rocket ship crosses the event horizon, which is um, where the escape speed is equal to the speed of light, then it's not able to, to leave the object. It's, it's doomed because nothing could go faster than light. So black holes um, form as a product of stellar evolution. If we have stars that are about 10 times or so more massive than our sun, they end their lives in this violent supernova explosion, which sends a shock wave careening into uh, interstellar space. What's left over is a core, the remnant of the star. And that core could be a very dense star called a neutron star, or if it's massive enough, it'll collapse into a black hole. So we have this object that is not giving off any light because it's no longer a star. Any light that gets near it can't escape it. How do we see it? Well, first we need to uh, define terms and say what it is that we mean by light. Um, so light is a major way that those of us with sight interact in the world around us. It's how we observe our surroundings and the night sky. And historically, astronomy has been all about visible light because for millennia, people would just look up, observe the stars and observe the planets and wonder about our place in the universe. 
But with all the rich colors that we see in visible light, it's only a sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. There is light at longer wavelengths with less energy, including the infrared, the microwave, and the radio, and light at higher energies or smaller wavelengths at gamma ray and X-ray light. Now, almost every object in the universe gives off light across the electromagnetic spectrum, from stars to galaxies to the very seeds of large-scale structure itself. So it's only by creating telescopes that could view the full electromagnetic spectrum do we have a complete picture of the universe. So though we can't observe black holes themselves, we could use light to observe a black hole's effects on their surroundings. And here's one way that we could see black holes. Many stars exist in a binary star system where they have a companion and they orbit around a common center of mass. Now in this picture, we are looking at a binary star system where both of the stars are very massive. So they're gonna end their lives in a supernova explosion and leave behind a black hole as a remnant. The star on the left is more massive than the star on the right. And so it'll go through its life quicker. So that star will expand uh, into the red giant phase and then it'll go supernova. Now at this point, the star on the right is still living the good life using hydrogen to helium in its core um, while its companion has become a black hole. Now winds from this companion star are going to expand out and start dumping material onto the black hole. And as its companion ages, it's going to inflate and get bigger and start dumping more and more material that will make its way to the black hole. And here's a zoom in on what that looks like on the right. So the material that starts orbiting towards the black hole um, forms a disk because of conservation of angular momentum. So it spirals around the black hole, makes it down to the center, and eventually falls into the black hole by which uh, the black hole will increase in mass. And we call this process accretion. So therefore the, the disk that spirals onto the black hole and feeds the black hole is called an accretion disk. Um, and this process uh, releases a lot of energy. In particular, it does a really good job of giving off X-ray light. So back in the 1960s were when the first rocket flight um, experiments were done, where um, X-ray instruments were launched on rockets above the Earth's atmosphere, because the Earth's atmosphere blocks X-ray lights. So if you want to see X-rays, you got to get above the atmosphere. And one of the first objects detected was um, an X-ray source of light from the constellation Cygnus, Cygnus X1. And this was an astronomical object. It came from, from outer space, not from our own Earth. And it was discovered that this object is a, a black hole in a binary star system. So now if we return back to our picture of stellar evolution and just run that movie forward, that uh, donor star is going to become, um, it's gonna go supernova, then eventually, it's going to become a black hole itself. Now, at this point, there's nothing to fuel either black hole. So they are dormant and they're not giving off any light. So how do we find these? Hold that thought, we'll get back to that. So what I'm talking about in this picture are what we call stellar mass black holes. So these black holes are the byproducts of stellar evolution and they're three to tens, maybe hundred times the mass of our sun. And uh, using X-ray light is a very efficient way to, to find these objects. We find them in our own galaxy in the Milky Way. This is a picture of the center of the Milky Way in X-ray light. And we also see them in other galaxies. Uh, these are some images of M51 and M83, also in X-ray light, um, where all those um, little dots are sources, point sources of X-ray emission. 
not all of them are black holes, some of them are neutron stars, but some of them are black holes in these X-ray binaries. Another class of objects are supermassive black holes. These are millions to billions of times heavier than our own sun. And they live in the centers of galaxies. And similar to their stellar mass cousins, they can grow by the process of accretion. Now, most galaxies have central black holes that are dormant, but some fraction do have black holes that are actively growing. And when we observe these objects, we call them active galactic nuclei or AGN. Um, so again, we have an accretion disk that feeds a black hole that gives off a lot of light much more energy than accretion onto a stellar mass black hole in an X-ray binary. Um, and some of the other differences is that the accretion disk in AGN um, give off light at optical and ultraviolet wavelengths, but they're also good X-ray emitters. And this comes from gas that's close to the black hole that upscatters light from the accretion disk up to X-ray energies. So because this process of accretion onto supermassive black holes is so energetic, we can observe AGN from our own cosmic backyard to literally across the universe. So one um, local example nearby galaxy is NGC 1365. And uh, we can see um, the optical picture in the back and the X-ray image in the front. And that bright point of X-ray light in the very middle is showing us light from the growing supermassive black hole. Another local example is Centaurus A at 13 million light years away. And what I love about this example is that it really demonstrates the power of multi-wavelength observations. So here's an image of the galaxy in visible light. There's a dust lane through the center, which is pretty dark. For if we looked at this in infrared light, we see that the dust is glowing. And you could actually start seeing behind that dust emission. You start seeing a bright point of light in the center of the galaxy. Um, and this is one of the powers of infrared astronomy, is that it lets you see through the veil of obscuring dust. When we look in x-rays, it starts looking a little bit different. You start seeing these. Um, thin filaments coming out of the center of the galaxy. And then if we extend this to the radio light, um, we see um, these thin filaments becoming plumes. So what the X-ray and radio are showing us are jets that are being launched from the AGN. These are collimated flows that are accelerating particles to close to the speed of light. And when we put this all together, this is the image that we see. So not only is it just a stunning image to look at, but what you can really see is um, the extent of the jets compared to the size of the galaxy itself. These jets um, that we're observing in the x-rays are thousands of light years long, and the radio jets and lobes are up to a million light years long. So you can see the impact that this black hole, which is teeny tiny compared to the host galaxy, could have, where it could be um, energizing these flows that outstrip the galaxy itself. So these examples so far have shown how we could use images to learn about the physics uh, in these objects. Um, so we could, another technique that we could use is spectroscopy, um, shown in this image. Um, so what's being shown here is the Crab Nebula. So it's a nebula of dust and gas. It's not a galaxy, it's not an AGN, but the principles are the same. Spectroscopy is helpful for studying lots of objects in the universe. So what's being demonstrated is that specific elements shine at very specific colors or wavelengths of light. And that's fixed, that's from quantum mechanics. And so if you disperse the light into the spectrum um, shown by the bottom panel, you can see these bright lines of emission that line up to specific elements. 
So in this way, spectra serve as fingerprints to determine the chemical composition of what we're observing. It also gives us an indication of the source of energy. And this is really important in our study of AGN because spectra um, provide evidence that what we're observing is being energized by an AGN rather than other processes in the host galaxy. So here is um, a, an average spectrum of a growing supermassive black hole. Doesn't look as pretty as the one in the last slide, but there's lots of information in it. So what we're seeing on the horizontal axis is the wavelength of light, while the vertical axis shows us um, the intensity of light at each wavelength. And those peaks that we're seeing are the same as those lines as we saw in the previous slide. So that's showing us the um, emission of light from specific elements. In this case, carbon, magnesium, oxygen, and hydrogen. And uh, this spans the, the wavelength range from the ultraviolet to the optical. Now, this is really um, powerful for observing AGN because um, galaxies don't give off um, a spectra that look like this. So when we see spectrum with these features, this gives us a clear indication that the galaxy that we're observing is hosting a growing supermassive black hole. So one way that we learn about these objects are examples how I showed in previous slides where you could take detailed studies of individual objects. Another thing that we could do is surveys where we take a telescope that scans the sky and just get data from that. Um, so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is one such telescope that does this. Uh, it has a location in New Mexico, another lo location in Chile. And over the lifetime of uh, the Sloan Survey, it has detected um, millions of images and observed millions of spectra that it stores in a database. And so far, this survey has identified over three quarters of a million supermassive black holes based on spectra that looks somewhat similar to this. And not only can we use spectra to um, identify what the object is, it also gives us an indication of the distance to that object. And here um, it's based on um, two things. One, the universe is expanding, and we could use the Doppler effect to our advantage. So an analogy of the Doppler effect is that if we hear a siren in a car that's driving away from us, um, the sound of that siren is or the pitch is going to get lower as our car moves further and further away. And that's because the wavelength of sound gets longer and longer. So too, as the universe expands and carries a galaxy away from us, the light that we observe coming from that galaxy is going to have wavelengths that get shifted to longer and longer and longer wavelengths. So when we take a spectrum of an extragalactic object, we will see that these features will shift to longer wavelengths. So we could take a measurement of the wavelengths at which we observe these features, compare it to the wavelengths that we know they should be based on the lab in Earth, and from that way get a measure of the distance to the object. So by doing this, um, just the Sloan Digital Sky Survey itself has found growing black holes in galaxies as close by as 14 million light years away and as far away as 12.8 billion light years away. And this is something that I do in my research. Uh, one of my projects is to go to telescopes to get spectra of objects that I think are good candidates um, to be AGN. So when I get the spectra, I am then able to determine whether or not the object is extragalactic, 
or if it's an annoying M star, which sometimes happens. Luckily, not too often, but it sometimes happens. Um, and then I could also measure the distance to the extra galactic object. And um, not only do we do surveys on the ground, we also do surveys in space. So I think probably lots of people are familiar with the Hubble Deep Field, uh, which is shown on the right um, for the southern field of Hubble, where Hubble just opened its shutters and took a picture on a what was supposed to be a blank patch of sky, um, integrated over 10 days of observations, and ended up detecting thousands of galaxies. The Chandra telescope or Chandra observatory, which observes in x-rays, also took an image of the same patch of sky and it detected over a thousand x-ray sources. Um, so not every galaxy is going to have a growing supermassive black hole, um, but, but so what so Hubble will show us where the galaxies are and x-rays will show us where the growing supermassive black holes are. And most of the x-ray points of light in this object, not all, but most, are growing supermassive black holes. And the most furthest away um, AGN in this Chandra image is 12 billion light years away. And for reference, the, the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years old. Um, Recently, scientists from uh, the Chandra X-ray Center in collaboration with System Sounds have sonified the Chandra Deep Field where they translate data into sound. So the colors are um, translated into specific tones. So red colors will be a low tone, purple colors will be a high tone. And the bar um, as it moves will show you where we are in the image. Right, so that's what the X-ray deep field sounds like. So it's another way to interact with the data. So the most distant black holes that we found from um, these optical surveys and from X-ray surveys are about 12 to 12.8 billion light years away. The most distant one yet detected lies at a distance of 13 billion light years away. So this was when the universe was about 670 million years old. The universe was a baby. And this is obviously an artist's rendition of um, uh, an AGN. The actual images for this object are a little bit less impressive, but they are important um, in the information that they provide. So what you could see at infrared wavelengths uh, is like a, a little little smudgy blob, but it's a source. It's it's a real object. Now, if you look at the visible light images at the position of that fuzzy blob, you see a whole lot of nothing. But that's important because there are several reasons why you would observe this, and this is one um, method that I use to try to find what I think are interesting active galactic nuclei. Now, what could happen is that the black hole is obscured in the optical. If you think about that picture of Centaurus A with the dust down the center, that dust lane blocks the optical light, but it shines brightly in the infrared. So looking for objects that disappear in the visible but are bright in the infrared is one way to find um, these enshrouded black holes. It could be that um, this object is at such a large distance that its optical light has redshifted into the infrared. 
or it could be one of those really annoying M stars. Um, so in my case, when, when I look for this, my, my goal is a little bit different than, than this research group. I'm not trying to find the most distant black holes. I'm trying to look for the ones that are more obscured. Luckily, I don't observe the annoying M stars too often. Most of the time I am finding AGN. Um, the most distant one that I found from that research project is at a distance of um, about 10.9 billion light years away. Um, and the object that this group found was at 13 billion light years away. And the way that you confirm the object is to go and get spectroscopy. Because again, that will give you the signatures that tell you what's powering the source, and it will tell you how far away it is. Also, from the spectrum, uh, this research group was able to measure the mass of the black hole. And it weighed in at about a billion solar masses, which is pretty high for something this early in the universe, which is a bit of a challenge to try to understand. All right, so we've talked about supermassive black holes in nearby galaxies. We've talked about supermassive black holes in far away galaxies. Is there anything closer to home? And the answer is yes. There is a supermassive black hole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we are here about 27,000 light years from the galactic center. And uh, the galaxy in, the, in yeah, the black hole in the center of our galaxy is dormant, which maybe it's a good thing. I don't know if we really want to live in a galaxy that has a powerful AGN. Um, but we know that this black hole exists due to the dedicated work of several research groups that have mapped out the position of stars in the galactic center. Um, so here is a 3D visualization of the work from Andrea Gez's group, where when we start out, we are zoomed in at 0.05 light years within the center of the galaxy, and it's going to zoom out to 0.65 light years. So what you're seeing is um, the motion of stars as they orbit around um, something that you can't see. Um, and they see, and they're kind of like on these chaotic orbits. And as we move back, um, the orbits of the stars tend to be on a, more of a plane. Um, so these observations were taken from 1995 to about 2015 or so. And what's being shown here is an extrapolation of the orbits back to 1893. But what you could do is just apply Kepler's laws to match the speed that at which the objects are orbiting to estimate the mass around which they must be orbiting. And when you do that calculation, you find out that the mass is 4 million times that of our sun. It's quite a, a discovery. And the Nobel Prize Committee agreed that it was a very important discovery this year by awarding the Nobel Prize in physics, um, partly to Roger Penrose for his mathematical proof that black holes are a natural consequence from general relativity, and to Andrea Ghez and Reinhard Genzel, who are part of competing research groups that have spent the past several decades using the largest telescopes on Earth and the most innovative techniques to control for turbulence in our own atmosphere and to peer through all the intervening dust to carefully map out the motions of stars to be able to measure the mass of the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And the fact that both groups operated independently and came to the same conclusions is evidence of um, the significance uh, of the result. All right, so Sagittarius A star for all intents and purposes is dormant. Um, sometimes you see some activity because stellar winds from the nearby stars sometimes dump some material into the black hole and so there'll be some flares, but it's wimpy compared to what um, active galactic nuclei usually look like. But it's interesting to ask whether or not Sagittarius A star could have had more of an active past. And there's some evidence that this might be possible. Um, the Fermi telescope, which is an observatory in outer space that observed gamma rays, 
observed these bubbles that ex um, extend 50,000 light years above and below the plane of the galaxy. And these bubbles have a lot of energy in them. Um, by mapping out uh, the motion of the gas in those bubbles, uh, they were able to determine that they must have been launched from an event at the galactic center six to nine million years ago. Irizita, which is an X-ray telescope that was launched in 2019, released this result in just December, where they found bubbles in X-ray light that are very similar in shape to the Fermi bubbles, also 50,000 light years across and consistent with enormous amount of energy injection from the center of the galaxy um, around six to nine million years ago. So the answer to the question of was Sagittarius A star ever an active galactic nucleus, observations of the Fermi bubbles and the Irizita bubbles give a definitive Maybe. Um, we can't really rule out that there wasn't necessarily a very energetic starburst event a bunch of years ago, um, though the amount of energy is quite high. The, the current PI of Irizita, Andrea Merlone, gave a colloquium, virtual colloquium, of course, um, at SDSCI just a few days ago. And one person asked during the Q&A, like, the amount of energy in these bubbles is, is enormous. There's no way this could be due to star formation, right? Like, can't we just be a little bit more definitive about this? And, and he was touching his bets. It's like, well, yeah, it's borderline. We're not quite ready to say yet. We're doing more observations. Um, so there might be more on this in, in the coming months to years. So uh, keep an eye out for that. All right, so Sagittarius A star is in, in our own galaxy. Um, but our closest look yet to the zoom in to a uh, most detailed picture of a black hole comes from the Event Horizon Telescope. And in order to see small scales, you need high resolution, and the bigger your telescope, the better your resolution. In radio astronomy, rather than creating one large single telescope, we get um, higher resolution by using an array of telescopes that kind of act as one virtual telescope and uses this process of um, interferometry, which is explained in the slide. Um, it's a little bit busy, but we'll go through it step by step. So in the top panel, what's being shown is that as you have two radio antennae and they move away from each other, you create a larger baseline between them, which kind of serves as a diameter for a virtual telescope. So the more you increase the baseline, the sharper your image is. The middle panel illustrates that what's being observed in radio astronomy is an interference pattern. So it's the wave nature of light. Um, so the observations happen in this foray space. And the bottom panel shows that as you increase the number of radio receivers, you build up the baseline. And as the Earth rotates, you fill in the gaps in foray space. So the image that you reconstruct becomes sharper and sharper. So the Event Horizon Telescope uses an array of telescopes across the globe um, as one large virtual telescope. And what's being shown here is um, the baselines between any uh, two receivers that, again, kind of acts like a diameter of a virtual telescope. So basically, the collaboration turned planet Earth into a telescope. They started taking observations in 2017 in April over the span of several days. They had two main targets. One was our good old friend Sagittarius A star. And the other is M87, which is a galaxy 50 million light years away that's launching this uh, radio jet that's thousands of light years long. Um, and the amount of data that they get is enormous. So it requires physically shipping disks to centralized locations where the um, research collaboration could work on the data analysis. And what you might have remembered from the previous slide is that one of those stations was at 
the South Pole. And actually a friend of mine was stationed at the South Pole during this observing season, though he wasn't part of the EHT project. But fun fact, in April, it's the winter at the pole and flights can't get in or out of the pole because it's eternal darkness and the weather is dangerously cold. So it's not until the station opens in October that they were able to physically ship the data up north where analysis could begin. And then in April of 2019, two years after the observations were taken, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration released this eponymous image to the world. Oh wait, no, sorry, that, that, that's not the image. That's a simulation based on general relativity that's blurred to match the resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope. This is the image on the right, a very striking resemblance between the data and the model. And for reference, on the left is what the input model looks like that was blurred to match the EHT resolution. So what the collaboration does is to create a library of models based on solving um, the, the, the physics equations of general relativity, create simulations based on those models that match the resolution of the telescope, then they match up the observed data with the pre-existing simulations to find a match and learn about the physical properties of the system. So um, again, the, the scales that we're looking at is the very, very inner regions around the black hole. So you're, it's really the inner edges of the accretion disk. And what was being observed, that dark part is what's called the shadow of the black hole. It's a combination of the event horizon, the area outside of which light cannot escape, and then the bending of light itself because the massive black hole has warped space-time. So in this general relativistic framework, uh, the paths of light are also going to be bent. So what did we learn from this? Well, one, we confirm general relativity. The data and the um, simulations match up eerily well. We also see a symmetry in, in the image where the bottom part of the ring is brighter than the top part. And that's because the bottom part, the light's moving towards us. So again, it's the Doppler effect. Um, so it causes this beaming to make the, the light or the emission look brighter. And this gives us a way to probe gravity in extreme conditions. And I, again, just want to hammer home that center part of that previous image where that circle, the, the little white circle at the center within um, that shadow, that marks the size of our solar system. The fact that we could resolve scales this small in a galaxy 50 million light years away is nothing short of remarkable. And the EHT collaboration just announced this exciting result two days ago, where uh, they're showing the, um, uh, the observations of M87 in polarized light, which is a way to map the geometry and strength of the magnetic fields near the black hole. And this is interesting because it starts to give us insight into the role that magnetic fields might play in launching um, those enormous jets, which right now there's lots of unknowns, but observations like this um, are starting to um, get us to uh, understand the physics behind those objects. All right, so we've talked about black holes from several times the mass of our sun to billions of times the mass of our sun, from our own galaxy to the furthest reaches of space from imaging the smallest region that you could possibly see around a black hole to looking at fuzzy blobs at the edge of the universe. We've done all of this using light. Another way that we can learn about black holes is through gravitational waves as a messenger of information. Gravitational waves are another consequence of general relativity. There are ripples in space-time from the most energetic processes in the universe, and they're caused by massive accelerating objects. So two black holes that are orbiting around each other 
will cause these ripples in the fabric of space that will propagate outwards in all directions and that will carry clues about their origins. So if we think about uh, the question that I posed kind of near the beginning of the presentation about in a binary star system where both stars are massive and they end their lives in black holes and they're no longer feeding and they're dark, how do we find them? This is one way we could find them. They inspiral and merge, they will give off gravitational waves and we now have observatories that are sensitive to detect gravitational waves. Um, so the observatories we have are LIGO, which is two interferometers, one in both those in the US, one's in Washington, the other's in Louisiana. And then there's Virgo in Italy, which came online in 2017. And LIGO started taking data in 2015. Now, it's important for LIGO to have two detectors, especially at the beginning, because having the two detectors was really important to confirm the signal. These gravitational waves, even though they looked very, um, uh, very prominent in, in that previous illustration, the previous video, they're actually teeny tiny. They are hard to actually measure. So when trying to measure um, those waves, a big concern is noise, whether it's an earthquake, whether it's traffic driving by on the road, those could cause little ripples that can mess up your observations. But if you have two detectors, they're not going to have the same source of noise in both the regions that are so physically separated. So if you detect the same signal at both locations quasi simultaneously, then that gives you a higher confidence that the signal is astrophysical in origin. And also the time between um, detections usually uh, corresponds to the light travel time between both detectors. So these ripples from gravitational waves, uh, the frequency of them, give us clues to what the mass of the merged object is and the mass of the individual objects that created the merged objects. And you could convert the frequency waves to sound and hear the difference. So the December event, which sounded higher pitched, uh, was the result of mergers of black holes that had lower masses than the event in September. Um, yeah, so not only are the discoveries exciting, but just the technology to enable these observations is completely incredible. And the Nobel Prize Committee agreed. This has been a good number of years for, for black hole physics in terms of getting recognized uh, by the Nobel Committee. Uh, so in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Rainier Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne for their contributions to LIGO and observations of gravitational waves. So as of May of last year, this was the census of compact objects um, whose mass had been measured. So what's being shown in this graph is massive objects um, where the units are in terms of our sun. Um, so as you go higher in the chart, uh, the larger the mass is. At the very bottom are neutron stars. I don't care about those, just ignore them. I mean, all right, neutron stars, I mean, I'm sure they're kind of cool, but I don't care about them for this presentation. What I want to draw your attention to are the, the purple circles, because um, those are X-ray binaries. Those are black holes that we know of that are in binary systems that are creating material from their donor star giving off X-ray light. Um, so sometimes for people who work in gravitational waves, they call them EM or electromagnetic black holes. The blue circles are black holes that we know about from gravitational waves. So the larger blue circle is the mass of the black hole 
after the two smaller circles have merged. So one thing they can immediately take away from this image is that the blue circles are above the purple circles. The black holes that we are detecting and learning about from gravitational waves are in a different mass regime than the ones that we're learning about um, from light, from our X-ray studies. So it really highlights the complementarity of having multiple messengers of information to really learn about these exotic objects. All right, so we've talked about stellar mass black holes. We've talked about supermassive black holes. Is there anything in between? Intermediate mass black holes that are between hundreds to thousands of times that of our sun. And it's reasonable to think that if every massive galaxy has a massive black hole, then maybe smaller galaxies have intermediate mass black holes, but they are difficult to identify. Lots of the diagnostics that we use to unambiguously say, this is an AGN, more massive galaxies, don't work so well for smaller galaxies because we can't rule out that other processes in the host galaxy can't be responsible for those diagnostics. But it is an interesting topic of study because it could be important for learning how the first giant black holes came to be. That most distant AGN that I talked about earlier, that's at about a billion solar masses, 670 million years after the start of the universe, there's no way that that black hole came from a stellar mass black hole. There's just not enough time to force feed it material for it to grow that massive that fast. So if we are able to identify intermediate mass black holes in nearby galaxies, then they can serve as analogs for what the progenitors of supermassive black holes might be. And that's what made this gravitational wave discovery so exciting. This detection was in May of 2019, um, though it was announced in September 2nd of, of last year. It was actually announced during um, the, the sci-fi convention, Dragon Con, that I've been going to for the past couple of years um, as a panelist in, in, in the space track. Obviously, last year, it, it was virtual. Um, and one of my friends who studies stellar mass black holes and intermediate mass black holes for, for his research, um, when this was announced, he sent me a message because he also does panels for Dragon Con. He's like, do you want to talk about this result tonight? I'm like, oh my gosh, he's not just giving me another presentation to think about. Uh, so, I mean, he mostly talked, I, I contributed a couple of things, but it was a really cool event because what we're seeing here, um, the not only was it the most massive signal detected by, by LIGO and Virgo, and the mass of the black hole, the final black hole, is 142 times that of our sun, 142. That's in the intermediate mass regime. What's also interesting, if you look at the, the black holes that were the progenitors, the ones that inspiraled and coalesced to form the more massive one, they're also pretty high especially um, the, the bigger one at 85 times that of our sun, it falls right within this regime that it's hard to explain that black hole from size, that black hole mass um, from normal stellar evolution. Um, so it could be that uh, maybe our ideas of stellar evolution could do some refinement, or as indicated here, maybe these progenitor black holes are remnants themselves of former mergers of smaller black holes. So as of 2020, when the LIGO and Virgo collaboration analyzed all their data from Serving Run 3, this is the, the census of, um, of black holes and uh, neutron stars, which are also compact objects detected um, through gravitational waves, um, as well as electromagnetically. Um, so to date, 50 gravitational waves have been detected since September 2015. And again, this is opening a different regime of 
black hole space that we otherwise were completely ignorant of before LIGO and Virgo came online. All right, so to return to the question that I posed as the title of this talk, how do we see that which gives off no light? Well, we can use light to observe a black hole's effects on its surroundings, whether it's feeding on any unlucky matter that gets too nearby, or we're mapping out uh, the motion of objects that are orbiting around the black hole and able to measure its mass that way. We could use a different completely messenger of, different messenger of information. We could use gravitational waves to find black holes that are in spiraling and merging. And though there's a lot that we've learned from multi-wavelength observations to multi-messenger astronomy over the past several decades and past five years even, there's still a lot left to learn. How did the first supermassive black holes form? What is the full population of black holes across all mass ranges, including those that are heavily enshrouded and hard to identify using visible light? What role do black holes play in shaping their environments and the galaxies in which they live? What controls the feeding habits of black holes? When, why do they start accreting matter? When do they stop? How much of it comes from accretion and how much of it comes from mergers? And in the past few years, we have learned a lot thanks to an array of multi-wavelength telescopes from the ground and in space as well as observatories detecting gravitational waves. But the future is even brighter. The next array of both ground-based and space-based observatories is really going to push the field forward. And in particular, I want to highlight JWST, which will be launching in October of this year. JWST is going to make fundamental contributions to all these questions. That most distant AGN that I talked about a few slides back, that and a handful of others that are around the same distance, that's the tip of the iceberg. JWST is going to show us the whole iceberg, as well as black holes that are even more distant. Closer by, it's going to unveil the most hidden black holes in our cosmic neighborhood. It will map out the energetics of galaxies hosting or creating black holes so we can understand um, what role AGN play in heating up their surroundings and what they might be doing to quench or maybe spurt star formation. So with JWST working in tandem with other observatories across the electromagnetic spectrum and across multiple messengers, we will be primed to really answer these fundamental questions about these exotic objects. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, thanks, that was great. So we'll thanks. open it up, uh, does it, uh, Harold, are you taking over? That wasn't the plan. <laughs> Did I do something? <laughs> Did I hit a button somewhere? All I was trying to do is switch back to gallery view. Okay. No, no, we're good. Yes, yeah, um, so does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yes. So, so Steph, first of all, thank you so much for, for the wonderful presentation. I, I, I've always been intrigued by black holes. Um, one thing that always puzzled me is, if there was a hypothetical observer outside the event horizon, and uh, if this observer watched um, a star or any any object enter the event horizon, why is it that the object appears to freeze the moment it enters the event horizon? Yeah, so that has to do with uh, the effects of relativity where <laughs> Normal physics goes to die, as one of my friends puts it. Right. I, um, it has to do with um, with effects like time dilation. Like time just seems to get longer um, when you're um, in, in the relativistic regime. So that's kind of like the short answer. We don't have much yeah. experience of that with like in our normal day to day life, though. I mean, you could do some you know fun experiments of like what happens when when you fly and um, how you're 
how your clock, probably you don't have a, no one has a clock really that sensitive, but if you had a really sensitive clock, the time that would pass on, on your flight versus if you were on earth would be ever so slightly different. Mm -hmm. So even, and light doesn't have mass, does it? It light does not have mass, right? Um, how, how does, uh, so how does it cause spaghettification? I mean, that's, that's something that always intrigued me. Like uh, it, spaghettification. Yeah. How does yeah. It so I, so I, I think it's more that mass would get spaghettified. So right, this is this effect where if, and this happens, I think, more around supermassive black holes than the stellar ones, because I think the stellar ones, um, the tidal forces are, are greater, so spaghettification doesn't happen. But it does in the, in the supermassive black holes, where if you cross the event horizon and, you, and you're something with mass, then the tidal forces between um, the top and the bottom are really strong, which causes... Um, the object to elongate or spaghettify. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that light itself actually gets spaghettified. I think it's more, you know, stuff with with mass that does. Okay. But it gives the illusion that it's the it's light that's getting elongated. Yeah. So it's light different. itself will get warped because of like gravitational lensing, but it's not that the light's getting like pulled, right? Okay. If it was mass, it gets pulled. If it's light, it's just space time itself is warped. So it's got like this kind of warped shape as it just kind of travels along space. Right. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Question. Is there some reason why these jets and lobes produced by an active galactic nucleus have to come out along the galactic um, polar axis? If not, is there any guarantee that successive jets and lobes will all come out in the same direction? And if not, what would happen if one came out from our galactic nucleus straight towards us? <laughs> Yeah, we wouldn't want to be in the way of that, I don't think. Um, so yeah. I don't think they necessarily have to go through the, the, the polar axis of the galaxy. Because like, so an interesting thing is, so they, they do seem to go perpendicular to the plane of the accretion disk. But the accretion disk and the plane of the galaxy don't actually have to be aligned. They could be misaligned. So it's not always the polar axis of the galaxy that the jets will, will travel along. Does that answer the question? But once you've got an established accretion disk, it's not going to change its orientation very easily because you'd have to throw in a, an awful lot of new matter um, heading in a different direction. Um, so with any luck, we're out of the firing line for the foreseeable future. Yeah, so I, you know, of all the things that I would be worried about, of um, you know threats from space, I think uh, I'd be more worried about an asteroid impact than I would a, a jet from Sagittarius A star. Because, I mean, part of it is that there's, there's not really a steady supply of fuel to create a jet around Sagittarius A star. There were some interesting um, observations a few years ago where there was something there, there's arguments over whether it was a star or whether it was like a, a gas cloud or a dust cloud. But there was some evidence that it was going to get accreted onto the black hole and we'd see some fireworks in uh, the center of our galaxy. I mean, it wouldn't have been anything like what we see with launching the, these jets, um, but that kind of fizzled. That was didn't end up being as exciting um, or as energetic as, as, as predicted. Um, but yeah, it, I, I would have a hard time imagining a scenario where um, enough matter could sustain an accretion flow at very energetic levels around Sagittarius A star. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question about one of the figures you showed early in the uh in the presentation, it was the specter of your uh, black hole. Yeah, let me get to that. I'm trying to use the new cool like touch bar feature on my computer. All right, is yeah. this the one? Perfect, right. it works. Yeah, yes. I was just curious where the background came from. 
the um, so what the uh, on the spectra. So I see a background, and I see that somebody has fit a line to to measure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the the continuum level. So. Right. So what's being shown here is uh, so what we observe in, in the spectrum, right, are these emission lines and they're superimposed on the continuum of, um, of, of, the, of the object. So if, if there wasn't, so these lines are coming from gas that is being energized by the accretion disk. The continuum itself is coming from the accretion disk. Okay, so the so lines that are being fit, um, so this line is to the ultraviolet, which has mm -hmm. a power loss slope, and then there's a different slope uh, once we get to the optical. It's a, it's a little bit less steep. Um, so so yeah, so that that's coming that's coming from the accretion disk uh, around the the AGN. So is that sorry? Is that just like the the black body radiation, or is it just? Yes. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Um, and the other thing that I was kind of interested in, this is maybe a philosophical question, where do you stand on the stance of information loss in black holes? Yeah, information loss in black holes. Oh, man. Yeah, that's an excellent philosophical question. I mean, it's not something that, you know, I've really thought that much about um, because it gets, um, it gets complicated. <laughs> and I, I guess I would say... Um, there are people much smarter than me who, who've spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and honestly, I don't even understand some of the, the solutions, like the whole holographic principle. Like I saw our <laughs> such kind to give, give a talk once when I was in grad school and, you know, I, I just couldn't really internalize, uh, what, what, what he what was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Though I think there was some recent work, some, uh, on this in, in the past couple of years where I think a, a group um, published some possible solutions for um, the whole information paradox, but I, I haven't actually read that in detail. Okay. So Steph, you fled Boston altogether? I'm a fellow BU alum. I went to the law school there, I think a little bit before you though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of call Boston my, my adopted home. So I had a great time there. Um, yeah, so I went to BU for undergrad. And then I worked at the CFA for three years as a mission planner for the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And then I started grad school in uh, at Hopkins. And then, you know, as Jeremy said, then I was at Yale. So I kind of been like moving around uh, the, the East Coast. And I always thought I'd get back to Boston, but, you know, sometimes you just got to go where the jobs are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Steph? Well, Stephanie, thank you very much for a very clear explanation for this non-scientific person uh, and exploration. Very well done. Thank um, you. I especially enjoyed, enjoyed Kip Thorne getting the Nobel Prize after he had done the simulation for Interstellar. Yeah. And I thought, there you go. There, that's art mirroring life or the other way around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like he published papers based on that. <laughs> See, so if you just have like a movie studio, studio supporting your research, there are great things that you could do if you had some funding, right? Yep, yep, that's great, that's great. Well, thanks again. Well, thank you. I don't have a question, but I'd like to make a comment. I really enjoyed the way you put the X-ray, meet the music to the X-ray. It was very cool. That was just fascinating. Yeah, yeah, the, the Chandra X-ray Center gets, gets all the credit for that. They, uh, um, they, there, there's this effort now, um, like with Chandra and, and with Hubble and some other places where they're sonifying data. So it's a way to, to make astronomy images accessible to, to people who have low vision or who are blind. So it's a way for them to also kind of like experience the richness, even if they, they can't see it. And it's, um, it's this effort that's just gotten more, it's been picking up steam like over the past few months or so. And it's really cool to see what they come up with. 
oh, it's, uh, I think it's brilliant. I mean, just the way everything is interconnected. And yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's beautiful. It, it sent a shiver down my spine listening to it. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I just saw that two days ago and I was like, I need to update my slides. I need to put this in my talk. This is too cool to not show. Yeah. There's actually, there's some NSF foundation grants for scientific crossover for arts. I know my son is trying to get a grant. He's, my son's a musician in New York. He's trying to get a grant to go to um, Antarctica on an wow. artist's, artist's mission. I think he's out of his mind. <laughs> oh, I want to go with him, Harold. He's definitely giving it a shot. He's determined to get a grant. To the that sounds like fun. Yeah. Go hang out with the penguins down there. Yeah. Harold's the guy who thought it was too cold to observe when it was. <laughs> That's right. It was 55 this degrees. This is true. 55, you didn't want to come out. I am a total wuss when it comes to that. <laughs> I understand. I don't think I could. I could go to Antarctica. Maybe, maybe during the the summer, when it gets as warm as freezing, but right. <laughs> not otherwise. Well, there's no light pollution down there. I mean, it's a great place for observing. It absolutely <laughs> is. You could survive. I think it's easier. So my friend, who's been stationed at the pole for a couple of times, he's said that it's like easier to get to the International Space Station than it is to get to the pole at some times. <laughs> Because like you're you are cut off in winter, I mean it's only like medical emergencies, life or death, where they will send any any flights there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had to do that a couple of years ago. Somebody yeah. was gravely ill. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it like daylight for half of the year in Antarctica? So maybe the observation really isn't that great. <laughs> it depends on what you're observing, life. right? Like there's um. Like millimeter observing is, you know, they, they like, um, oh, which is, what's the name of the observatory? I mean, there, there's several down there. There's Neutrino Observatory. Right, right. Buried under the ice. Yep, yep. So it doesn't matter if the sun's out or not. Exactly. And they're just detecting particles, so they don't care if it's, you know, night or day. Didn't they just have a, an article uh, I was reading? about the mapping of the Milky Way. A gentleman down there over the past 15 years, I believe, has been taking photographs and they finally put them all together. And he has the entire Milky Way uh, as one large photograph. Let's put it that way. That's pretty cool. I need to look that up. I'm not sure if I've seen that. I think that was from Finland, Fran. Was I think it, it was from the other pole. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it was one or the other, up or down. It was called the dark. I'm doing sure. that. You would have to take half the Milky Way from each pole because necessarily half um, one one end of the Milky Way can't be seen from whichever pole you're at. Yeah, that would be cool, like a 3D view. Yeah, I'm going to have to see if I have the link and I'll, I'll post it uh, on the web page. I, I know uh, it was... Uh, I think it was Yahoo, but it was also from Business Insider had the article. I'll, ha I'll have to dig it up if I can find it. Yeah, interestingly, Forbes is Forbes.com often has some very interesting astronomical stuff from time yeah. to time. In the yeah. pe period, there was a great fondness for three, um, 360 degree panoramas which they basically mounted around the, um, the walls of a room and um, paying public just came up through a staircase into the middle to admire. You could do that if you, you've got a really good three, um, 360 degree Milky Way. Mm. And one half of the sky could be put on a dome overhead, though the other half would be underfoot. There, uh, Lou just put the link in uh, the chat. Oh, okay. That was quick. <laughs> there it is. One point seven gigapixel image. Hmm. Talk about commitment. Yeah, seriously. You know, when I first got my DSLR, I tried to convince myself this was what I was going to do, but after a month, I gave up. <laughs> well, he did it over 15 years, I believe. Like I said, after a month, I oh. gave up. 
it's a lot of work. That is impressive. Very. Well, we have time, folks. Um, any anything else for the good of the order? Any other questions? Any other topics for? By the way, the article about the Nova, Lewis, I just want to let you know, says a new Nova was seen in Cassiopeia. So I didn't make that up. Yeah, 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 yeah. A new new was seen. Yes, but how do we All know? All I can say is we should, we should be able to edit in line. I'm just saying. When we first detect a Nova, how do we know it's new? And if it's far away, <laughs> it isn't new. It's right? a new new. If it's, if it's. Yeah. 80,000 so light years away, it's not new, new. new, right? Is that, uh, you know, that would be something along those lines. Hmm. And aren't there some stars that produce recurrent new uh, novas? In which there you go. And it flares up. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. It's Thank you, Henry. New. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. I stand corrected. I'm so ashamed. It, it's uh, new to you. <laughs> Hey, Lewis. Uh, Steph, you can see the high quality, uh, you know, you know, explorations that this group focuses on, uh, you know. Oh, it's all good stuff. We really need to see people in person. This is getting a little crazy. <laughs> We're all Speaking feeling that way. High quality, Lewis. <laughs> I got your high quality dessert, your favorite right here. Oh, very, 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 very good. Yeah, Jeremy you're on just right sent here. off a thing about, about that like last week or week before about the famous cake, which I never thought was so famous, but you guys just won't forget, I swear. Well, I once ate a long. very large piece of cake, substantially the size of my head. That's what they're talking about. But, uh... 